it's Thursday, it's 10 o'clock, so that means the Staff Canteen Virtual Pub is open. Um, I'm Cara Houchin, uh, welcome to the Lockdown Lock-In Live. Um, as usual, I have got some amazing guests waiting in the wings, and this week they've managed to stay off screen for this bit, uh, unlike Nigel Howard, so we're doing better than we did last week. Um, so... Before we get going, my snack, I'm sure you're all on the edge of your seats, is a little bit fancier than last week's pork scratchings. We've got a little bit of tapasi anti pasty going on here, so I'll be munching on that whilst we're going along. And I've also got a rum and ginger. I've not actually tried this, I just threw some rum and ginger in, so it could be awful, so we shall find out. Um, anyway, enough from me. Let's introduce uh, tonight's uh, guests. Um, I'm really excited because they all have a Wikipedia page, which means that I get to write a really fun intro that's probably full of lies, which I never get the chance to do. Um, so, first, she falls under the category of Gordon Ramsay Protégé. She started with him at Aubergine and has since worked at too many amazing restaurants uh, for me to mention them all. She now has a number of uh, restaurants herself, including Murano and Mayfair. Um, and first fun Wikipedia fact that Marcus Waring apparently said that she wouldn't last longer than two weeks at Aubergine when she started, but we can talk about that later. It's Angela Hartnett. Hello. Hi, Cara, how are you, love? I'm yeah. good, how are you? Well, thank you, all good, thanks. Good, thank Sitting you so much room. for joining me. No problem. <laughs> Um, so, what have you got with you? What what are you drinking this evening? What are you eating? Well, in typical form, I obviously just read that bit of your email just as I was about to sign. <laughs> so, I grabbed a bottle of red wine that we had left over from supper, which is a lovely Italian wine. Thank you from Passione Vino, Luca at Passione Vino. Thank you for that. And I've got no nibbles. I'm fine. If I need to, I can walk us all down to the kitchen, which nice. is. Jason about later. Oh man, I was supposed to say that. I've just given it away. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, Richard didn't have food last week. Richard Corrigan, he just had a cigar. So you, oh, you know, you're, right. you're not on your own. <laughs> no, that's good. Anyway, all set. Really good right. So next, I've already uh, already mentioned him. Um, as well as being an amazing chef, he's also a celebrity chef, which I feel like you've made it when you Google yourself and it says celebrity chef. So there we go. Um, he's not short of accolades. He got his first star aged just 25. Um, another chef from the Ramsey collection, but having read Wikipedia, I'm not sure if he'll thank me for that or not, but the stories might be fun later. <laughs> um, so uh, after, also, also he's a Michelin star chef, but he's uh, also terrifies contestants who are brave enough to come on Master Chefs of Professionals. It's Marcus Waring, and I'm really sorry. I feel like I've made you sound like a pantomime villain. <laughs> so, Marcus, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm very well. That's fine. I, I don't mind being a pantomime villain. <laughs> I feel like if we could hear everyone, they'd be like, boo, hiss. Yes, probably. <laughs> uh, what, are you, uh, what are you drinking and eating this evening? Uh, I've got a uh, gin and tonic uh, with some lime and I've got some popcorn. I love a bit of salty popcorn. Nice. Simple but good. Yes. Okay, and so my final, final guest, um, I'm pretty sure he's one of the most dapper chefs I've uh, had the pleasure of meeting. No offence to any other chefs that I've met, um, but his suits are always pretty amazing. Um, so he's worked for Pierre Kaufman, Marco Pierre White, and of course, to complete my Gordon Ramsay collection, he has uh, worked for Gordon as well. Um, he has a restaurant company and social company, and according to a restaurant critic in 2008, he was the best chef in the Gordon Ramsay group. Don't know if that's controversial or not. So, <laughs> it's Jason Appleton. Hey guys, Hello. how are you all? Very well. Lovely to see you all. <laughs> so Hi. what are you drinking and uh, eating this evening? I've got a, a glass of rosé because it's been such a hot day today. Uh, Les Benetta, uh, something we found uh, in uh, Forte de Marmi last year. I fell in love with, so we, we, we were well stuck with that. And I'm eating nothing because I've not just long finished my dinner. Um, I had a nice little bit of sea bass courtesy of my, my mate Johnny at Flying Fish. Oh, nice. Uh, so I'm pretty full at the moment. Nice. Okay. Um, well, we can do without snacks. It's fine. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Um, right. So the Lockdown Lock in Live is supposed to be a little bit of fun. Find out a bit more about you. Um, let people see a different side to you. I think. Uh, uh, obviously, Jason, loving the bar behind you, and you've showed us some other amazing, amazing parts of your room, which I'm sure we'll see, <laughs> see in a bit. Um, but to start so with, might, um, might be up for sale yet. Yeah, depends on how depends on how lockdown go keeps going. 
this could be your tour of the house. It could be like looking through the keyhole, Jane. Yes. We could start stepping each room. Be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how's lockdown going for you all? Um, I know one of, I was saying earlier before you jumped on, Jason, that one of our followers was asking that when the restaurants reopen, because you've been doing your um, meals every day, you might actually get a day off because you've not stopped cooking. Yeah, it's, um, it's been a lot of fun, actually, because a lot of the food I wouldn't normally cook in the restaurants. Um, it's just a lot of it's just thrown together. Um, and, you know, I, I, of course, we, we, we get access to some amazing ingredients. So we Get, I'm, I'm sure every every uh, a lot of the chefs out there are getting sent stuff by suppliers to help promote the um, the supply chain, which we're doing, of course, you know, and it's no hardship because we get to eat at the end of it. So I'm having a lot of fun. It's great cooking some really interesting food, but really simple. And I'm actually getting to use my stove at home. Yeah, you're an Instagram star. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> they say, yeah, well, um, and then um, obviously. Uh, Marcus, I said to you before, your um, your lockdown hair has caused quite a stir. So, <laughs> did you think that would be a thing? Never mind that you're amazing, chef. People just want to know about your hair routine. I love that. I love the way Angela just pulled their glasses down to see what my hair looked like. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> your big sister yeah. checking in on you. <laughs> gorgeous as ever, Marcus. Thank I love you. Her. Thank Always you. Um, no, I, I, I was strange enough. I, I was due to uh, have a, uh, a haircut just before lockdown, and, and for some reason it didn't happen. And then the turmoil of the what was on the horizon in the business world, and you cancel those all those unnecessary appointments, uh, and then then you find out you're in lockdown for three months. Then you regret the fact that you cancelled those appointments. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm just going to live with it and see how it goes. But my, my, my kids are having great fun with it, that's for sure, especially my daughter. <laughs> I want to see different styles. You should do a different style. Well, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> and Angela, what about you? What have you been doing to keep yourself busy in lockdown? Have you done anything where you thought, God, I ne never thought I'd be doing that? Um, well, yeah, just sitting at home for five nights a week was quite a novelty for chefs. It was just doing that alone. It took us all a few weeks to admit that it was actually something we quite like doing, you know. I know you're not supposed to because it's obviously time of crisis, but given that we always work so many nights, it's lovely to be home. Um, I've been helping my friend Lulu. Um, she's been doing this thing, Cook 19, where we've been cooking for the NHS. So I've done that every week since we've gone into lockdown, which has been really good. Not every day, just a couple of days a week. And then we've just opened the takeaway, actually, which is something I never thought I'd do, but we're doing takeaway pasta, which is absolutely killing me. I'm exhausted. I've never worked so hard in my life. Like, <laughs> I had to ring Ewan at Fortnum's and say, can I borrow the electric pasta machine? Because I'll just see my arms just like stupid. <laughs> you know, anyway, like muscles. Muscles. <laughs> exactly. So we do that two or three days a week. But the best thing in lockdown is I watched The Last Game. Have you guys watched it? The Last Dance with Michael Jordan on Netflix. Mm. Oh, it's great, great isn't it? Isn't it? That's brilliant. That has been my favourite show in lockdown. I've loved it. Anyway. So yeah, no, it's all from the lockdown lock in live, which you didn't think you'd be doing either. Yes. <laughs> brilliant. OK, so let's start. Let's play a game. Um, I want to obviously uh, test your friendship, hopefully. You'll all still be friends by the end of this, but we'll give it a go anyway. Um, have you got your pens and paper ready? Got it. Give it a go. You hope we won't be friends at the end of it. Is that what you're trying to do, Cara? Just split us up. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 because I want you to work with me again after all this is finished. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm going to ask you four questions. And uh, if you write down the answer on your paper, it is uh, who you think this is, this applies to out of you guys. So. It can be yourself if you want it to be. So first one, you've all uh, been on TV, you've all judged um, TV cooking competition. So he, who is the best TV chef judge? Who, who's answering these questions? We are on your oh, television. Yeah, <laughs> write it down. Okay, and then show me your bit of paper. Put it up to the screen. <laughs> okay, so Angela said herself, <laughs> Marcus said himself, but Jason, you said Marcus, so he's the only one that's oh, given like... <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't judge anybody on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you do judge cooking competitions, though. You do judge chef competitions. Oh, I do, I do, I suppose, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> so why, why did you put Marcus and not Angela? 
Well, you know what? Because hey. obviously I've seen Angela do great British menu. She's, she, she's, yeah, Angela's, Angela's amazing. Angela's made for TV. There's no two ways about that. And I think, you know, uh, the new show, what Angela's doing um, with uh, Mary Perry, I think it's, it, it's made for her. I think she's doing a fantastic job. But I just think, you know, any stepping into Michelle Rue Jr.'s shoes was going to be an absolute nightmare for anybody. Uh, and it was probably the most wanted, although people wouldn't admit it, it was probably the most wanted uh, job on TV for a professional chef at Michelin level and I just thought Marcus absolutely nailed it I thought he did a fantastic job and I just think he, um, he, he he's just, you know perfect in that role what do you think of that Marcus it's nice Thank isn't you. It? it's only just started <laughs> I, I, I remember I remember when the message that Michelle I, I remember reading uh, Cater online that Michelle uh, had left the BBC uh, for various reasons and I thought to myself in my office that there's going to be a lot of chefs that would really enjoy the challenge or the opportunity of taking over from Shell, uh, and there'd be a huge amount of people interested in putting in their name in the hat. I, 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 strange, you know, I would love to have done that job, and it would have been my first choice job on television because it was about professional cookery, and I've always loved the Master Chef show. I actually deleted the email because I just thought that's just a million miles away from what I'm about and that it's the sort of thing that I would ever get asked to do um, and then somewhere down the line I got a text message from the producer who I know we all know we've all stepped into MasterChef in, on many different occasions to judge to participate or whatever uh, and we all know the key people that run the show and make the show um, and I just got a text message saying Marcus if you've got five minutes of the time and it was just when I was about to we launched the Barclay after five years of, of taking it over from Gordon and um, I put some money into it and I uh, met up with the producers and they just kept, they came to see me straight away. I was just about to launch the restaurant and uh, they said, Mark, we're not going to be around the bush. We just want to just ask you the one question is, will you, will you take over from Michelle Rue? And I have to be honest with you, it, I, I could, if I hadn't been sitting down, I would have fallen over. I was more surprised than anyone else. And I'll be honest with you, it was an absolute honour to, re to replace Michelle. I didn't see it coming at all, um, and I and I and I and I went with it. And there's no training. You you go on set. You go with the flow, and you be yourself. There was just two rules: um, smile and don't swear, but be yourself. And that was all and I that, did. And that would have been hard for you. That would have been very <laughs> tough. <but it> was. <laughs> That's why I put your name there. <laughs> I'm changing my vote. I'm saying Marcus, Marcus is judging well. food, trying to get him to smile is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's smiling now, so we're all right. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, who is the scariest chef in the kitchen? If 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 chefs, your chefs were going to judge you and they're in a the kitchen with you all, who do you think they would think was the most scary? Right. Ready? Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> What's the first you part? You're cheating. I'm not scary. <laughs> I'll put Marcus again because Marcus is scary. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, what? why? Why both of them? Well, for a start, I work for Marcus. I was his uh, sous chef for a long time. And I've been at the brunt of it occasionally. I think I remember the worst was when I'd been to see um, a band at the, um, we only, we did six days then when we were at Petrus. And I've been to see a band at um, Brixton Academy and I was so hung over on the Monday. I kept sort of going to the toilet, trying to pretend <laughs> I was okay and just throwing up thinking I'd got away with it. And he was just, I could just see the anger getting worse and worse in his eyes and the way he was filleting fish. So he can be scary. And Jason, when we worked in Dubai, my cor my office was, I'm trying to think, yeah, probably like the size of Pollen Street away from Jason's kitchen. And I could hear him when he kicked off. So, you know, not both of them can be quite scary at times. <laughs> <laughs> They're good people. Only a long time ago, remember? Yeah, a long time ago. Gosh. <laughs> Jason, you put Marcus. Mm -mm. Because right. we're... we're uh, I, I've never, we, we've never actually all worked in the same kitchen together. Me and Anja's, but yeah. uh, we've never all worked in the same kitchen at the same time together. But uh, we've all worked, obviously, for, for Warren at the same time. But our, um, when we opened up Maze uh, 2005,
I, uh, Gordon and Marcus was pretty much inseparable in those days. And they used to come and sit on the chef's table. Uh, and obviously, you know, Mays was incredibly busy. Um, you know, we, we came up with this stupid idea that you we'd, we'd invent 20 dishes and you could create your own tasting menu. I don't know which idiot came up with that. But anyway, um, <laughs> and, and people would order 12, 14 dishes. and We would be so knee deep. And bearing in mind this restaurant, you know, back in back then was like crazy busy, like 120, 130 for lunch, 200 for dinner, uh, nonstop, seven days a week, no days off. It was just horrendous. And then Marcus would sit on there on the chef's table with Gordon and they'd order a couple of dishes. I put it up there. And then all I get was, do you think there's a little bit too much gelatin in the jelly? And then they'd just stare at me. And I'm like, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I'm like fucking, I'm like knee deep in checks. I'm like, and they're like, what do you think, Jason? I'm like, uh, 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 um, um, maybe, maybe, uh, I'll, I'll look at it a little bit later. <laughs> Marcus? And, and just to get the message across, we used to send, me and Gordon, we used to send in Mark Askew to sort yeah, of yeah. behind the scenes and try and sort Jason out. Cause he was, yeah, he, he was, um, it was a phenomenal restaurant. Um, and the idiot that came up with the tasting ideas was the idiot that just told us about the story. You, Jason, <laughs> your idea. Um, and it was it was quite a unique restaurant, a unique restaurant that actually was cutting edge and doing something that no one had ever done before in London. And um, tapas style food, tasty menu style, uh, 120, 200 covers a night. It was a phenomenal restaurant, and wow, it was what I what I remember. Uh, about Mays, apart from sitting on the chef's table drinking amazing cocktails with Gordon uh, and watching Jason <laughs> his bollocks, great fun. Um, was was the process that Gordon put Jason through? And Jason, I think you just come back from Dubai, and mm -hmm. this idea came about. And you've been in Dubai quite a while. Um, and I remember, I remember Gordon coming back with this, 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 this restaurant location and you came up with the concept. And I remember the tastings that you used to have to go through. It was me, there was Gordon, it was in Angela's kitchen at the Connell. You know, Mark, would, Mark Askew would come in and, and Gordon would invite as many chefs as possible to come and critique Jason's tastings. And he had a lot of tastings. And I, to be honest with you, you took a pasting in those tastings. Well, never once did you get nasty or upset or aggressive. You took all the criticism on board um, and through those tastings, Maze, this concept of has developed through just everyone throwing their 10 cents worth in, but no one really knew where you were going with the idea. And it was all about that, finding the reason behind why you did certain things on certain dishes and that level, that sort of fine tuning. Like all chefs, we all trying to find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, also, I used to walk away from that and I just could never have taken that level of criticism from so many arseholes on a chef's table. It was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> wearing. I never was criticised like that. Well, you know, you were there, Angela. <laughs> well, I mean, very good. I remember Jason's monkey cheeks. I'd never had yeah. monkey cheeks before, and they were amazing. He deep fried them, and he gave them with this little pickle salad. They were delicious. Well, they were on the Connaught menu before he opened Maze, but that was fine. That was <laughs> Anyone who came for a tasting and used my kitchen. I had yeah, no, right, at the back, you did. remember? Yeah, oh my I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, but I don't think there's only, there's only Phil Carmine from knows this, I think. God, do is, I know this? Is, <laughs> is, 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 so we were at the back, all you lot were on the chef's table, and um, Gordon's firing loads of questions at us, uh, and Phil had been basting this quail. Um, but he but he, he and he left the spoon on the side of the of the stove, and it was been it's been in hot butter, so like while he'd been basting the quail. And I freaking picked up the spoon. I literally put it into a sauce, put it straight in my mouth, and it, it turned all my or turned all my lips white. <laughs> so when I bought the next dish to the chef's table, and I'm trying to explain it, and it looked like I've been trapped in a desert for like six days, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm trying to explain to her what the dish was, and Gordon's like, can I remember? Gordon was like, Are you okay? Are you all right? Do you want a glass of water? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> No, you never did that again. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, right, next question. Who makes the best pasta? Easy. 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 <laughs> I'm waiting for their answers. My answer is me. <laughs> and Angela, of course. Cool. Oh, no, unanimous. <laughs> Marcus, why is Angela's pasta so amazing? Because 
it, it's part of who she is. Um, it's part of our, our, she is Italian, the blood it runs through her veins and she's lived and breathed it all of her life. And you, when you meet her family, you can see the passion that they have, not just for where they're from, but also for Angela. And Angela has battled, I think, for fighting off so many different styles of what one wants to do. And I think what Angela's, I always used to remember going into the corner and seeing Angela. She was always at the back of the kitchen making pasta. She was almost, it was her place where she went to find herself and get some peace and quiet and just make a load of raviolis and make a load of pasta. And I think, I think it's in her blood. Uh, and you may, you're not, I, I just think it's something that, it, it, it's, it's, you think of Angela, you think of Italian food um, and great, great cookery and just great, beautiful flavors. And sometimes we just wish we could just do more of the simple things in life. Um, but I, I mean, I never knew, I never, when I worked with Angela and she worked with me, I didn't see the Italian chef in her. Um, I never saw that. I didn't know that. I didn't really know her. I just knew her as a cook. Um, who used to ride this really fucking stupid bicycle to every kitchen she ever <laughs> <laughs> More often than not, I've fallen off it or something like that. And But I, I never knew. It overtook me every morning. <laughs> I didn't know there was this Italian style of cuisine within Angela's uh, repertoire. Because even when Angela went to the Connaught, there was so much emphasis of Gordon and Gordon Ramsay Holdings and the Connaught traditional French cookery. That never really came through until Angela got Murano. And then you saw you saw the Italian flavors start to shine out of her, and it's such a lovely country, lovely cuisine. Uh, and Angela is one of the shining lights of Italian cuisine in London. Oh, thank you, Marcus. Oh well, I was expecting a unanimous vote to be honest, but I just wanted to throw that one in there. So, <laughs> um, okay, and final question: um, Who do you think Gordon would say is the best chef out of all of you? Oh, <laughs> yeah, which can I? Need, I need a hair, can hit my head. Oh, no, dear. Who, 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 what you say, who do you think was the best chef? Who would Gordon pick out of you all? Yeah, I think Mark, I think Mark's is right. <laughs> Angela, <laughs> I think you're right, Marcus. I think that's just purely because he's just like Gordon. <laughs> no, no. Angela, he sees a lot of honesty in you. He just sees bullshit with me and Jason. <laughs> Don't you remember, Marcus, years ago when you opened the Savoy? Was it the Savoy or was it the review from... Who was that critic at the Times years ago? Years Jonathan ago. Meads. Jonathan Meads. And he wrote, and it, was, it must have been the Savoy, you just opened the Savoy, and you and I drove down to wherever we drove the, sta the, the strand to buy the papers. Because those days, nothing was online. You had to go and get the papers, read it at midnight. And Jonathan Meads had said that he thought Gordon had created a Frankenstein. Not because <laughs> Marcus was like that, because he'd created a better chef than Gordon. I mean, that's basically what he said in that article. Don't you remember? It was the article of Petrus, actually. It was Petrus, right, that's it, okay. And it was, Petrus, and it was the meal that Jonathan Meads had. Um, and Jonathan Meads had this meal, and he had, it's the one of the first meals he had that he had no alcohol. He wanted to taste, he, he'd heard about the reputation of Petrus, and he wanted to, to come and taste the food, and he loved his wine. And mm. I remember the sweetbread dish that I cooked him. Um, oh. Long story short there, um, there's a certain Mr. White who got involved in that uh, review. I got a nine out of ten, and I remember it was a picture of a chef in a Ferrari driving very fast past another chef, which happened to be Gordon in the picture. Um, but it was uh, it was um, it was a great time for me and for Gordon, and I, I appreciated the nine out of ten with Jonathan Meads was quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but there was a certain a certain chef. Not many not people can claim to that. I can. Yeah. I can. <laughs> But not many people can. Great. I can't. A fantastic, a fantastic food critic. Yeah, amazing food critic. Yeah. Jason, how come you didn't put yourself then? No, you can't do that, Jim. <laughs> Gordon, listen, listen, I, it, was, it was very different for me because Gordon and, uh, sorry, Marcus and Andrew grew up with Gordon. You know, I, I, I used to... You know, I, I trained with a lot of different chefs and, you know, I, when I first learned about all these guys is when Aubergine opened. I knew Gordon, I've met Gordon when I was working for Marco. 
and Gordon won't mind me ribbing about ribbing about this, but I remember Gordon coming back very distinctly from France. Uh, when he came back, he came in the kitchen for a couple of days working with Marco while he was getting aubergine sorted. And he came in and, and um, a couple of boys in the kitchen, yeah. Michael, Michael Lampy and all the boys were like, oh, that's Gordon, that's Gordon Ramsay. Uh, and he, um, he had this, old, the old fashioned chef's jackets, which probably many kids won't remember today with the rubber buttons. Do you remember the rubber buttons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With what, that what, melt, what melt in the wash, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. big, big, big rubber buttons. And he came in the kitchen with them and I was like, what's he got that on for? And everyone's like, oh, he's going to be the next big superstar. He's going to be the next big superstar. And he, and he did it. He actually did a pasta dish, Ange, actually. He did, a, he did a ravioli, like little tortellini type dish with a vegetable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll never forget it. And he cooked it for Marco. Marco was making a big fuss about um, Gordon coming back from France. And, uh, you know, Gordon spoke fluent French. And, uh, and then they start talking about this restaurant. They didn't mention the word aubergine, but talking about this, this restaurant where Gordon was going to be opening up. Uh, and that became aubergine. Uh, and I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not just saying it, you know, uh, but I've got to say that I've eaten in a lot of restaurants in my lifetime. And Aubergine, quite frankly, was probably one of the best restaurants that's, that's probably ever, ever been seen in this country, I think. And I, and I generally believe that. I think it was just, we'd never seen food like that in this country at that point. And I just thought it was incredible. And I used to eat there. I couldn't afford to eat there, but I used to eat there quite regularly. Much the annoyance of these guys, because I'd be the last table coming in. At 10.15 at, 10 at night, having the tasting menu. <laughs> so, so on aubergine then, um, is that true that I read on uh, Wikipedia that, Marcus, you said Angela wouldn't last two weeks? Yeah, I mean, the aubergine was quite an extraordinary kitchen in, for many different reasons. And I, I actually knew Gordon. I worked with him at the aubergine uh, at Gavroche a couple of years before then. And, and actually, I was one of the chefs that first started in that kitchen. And it was quite hard in those days to get a brigade together. No one really knew Gordon. The only the best places to work in the world or in the country were always in the five star hotels or Gavroche, and we'd already been and done Gavroche. And uh, when I was at when I was at the Aubergine, we 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 really struggled. Gordon struggled to maintain staff. Uh, and one day we had this young lady turn up on a fucking bicycle um, <laughs> for a trial. She left the bike outside and she chained it to the lamppost right outside one of the top restaurants in London. Like that that was Angela. Um, <laughs> um, and she came downstairs to do a trial. And I remember before, before Angela arrived in the kitchen, Gordon read out this sort of, I don't know whether it was a CV or whether it was about this, this, this young lady who was coming to come and spend the day with us. Uh, and, he, and he said, I think it didn't, I don't think Angela had much experience, but I know that she'd had a degree uh, and she was very well educated. And um, I think a history degree, if I'm right, Angela. Uh, yeah. And people with are normally more intelligent than to come down into the fucking aubergine kitchen for a trial. They normally go off and do bigger, better things. But for some reason, Angela had this really strange idea that she'd come and try this, try this kitchen out. Anyway, we um, we had a sweepstake uh, in the kitchen before Angela arrived, uh, and uh, I gave her two weeks. Yeah, and, and no one gave Angela much further than a month uh, for some reason. I don't know why. It was not a theme, a, a place for females. It was a hard cutting edge kitchen. And it was brutal. Angela came to the trial. She got the job. She came and she stayed. And I lost the bet. In fact, we all lost the bet. And I suppose you could say the rest is history. Um, and did Mark I... ask you actually have to put his hand in his pocket? No. <laughs> yeah, to him. I yeah, bet to he's never got over it. <laughs> Duke of Westminster, you mean? He's got more properties than the Duke of Westminster, Mark ask you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Don't worry about that. He's the only one laughing during the lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, did you know about this this sweet thing? I did eventually, I did eventually, and it never really bothered me. I do remember Marcus at Christmas because Gordon was always generous, and we all got lovely tips and stuff. And I remember Marcus giving me a hug, going, "Well done, you know, you sort of survived from October to Christmas." But then, um, but I also remember. I'm just trying to think. You just reminded me of a story about the aubergine. Yeah. No. Anyway, there's so many stories about the aubergine. Yeah, it was a tough kitchen, but it was a fun kitchen, and I think I got on well because despite the fact I did it because I had this history degree I had a different level and I used to um always talk to Gordon like he was just Gordon and I would always see Gordon like, I remember one time I'd gone out for dinner and it was when Steve Terry it must have opened the what was the Atlantic Canteen. no no but after that Atlantic bar what was the Coast. Only, yeah Coast. Coast. 
and we'd all gone to eat there and I'd gone with friends and everyone heard about the aubergine. They were saying, oh, it's like Vietnam. That's how everyone describes it. It's I'm what? I was like Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was the funniest thing ever. So Monday morning, I go into the kitchen and start telling Gordon this. And I could see Mark just looking at me going, will you just shut the fuck up? Are you trying to ruin everyone's week by winding him up? You know, but we got on well and we had a good time. And I remember breaking the souffle moulds. I went into the fridge that was really narrow and I sort of turned my butt. And believe it or not, I was very thin then. I went down to like a size 10 because we never ate anything and we were just working so hard. And I managed to just unbalance the souffle moulds and knock literally 30 on the floor, broke them. And all I could hear was Gordon going, what the fuck's Dizzy Lizzie done now? Because that's what he'd call me. And I just popped my head out going, oh, just one or two, Gordon, one or two, and then ran in the patient going, Damien, I've broken 30 moles. You've got to go to Hanson's. You know? God, <laughs> Damien. Yeah, gosh, Damien. Damien. Pastry chef who could peel apples asleep. It'd just be asleep, like peeling apples. <laughs> <'cause it's> so... <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to tell aubergine stories all, all right. Gara, if, you, if we could talk about the aubergine, we'd be sitting here till the end of lockdown. Um, <laughs> well, I have got to interrupt you, and I, I have got some questions coming in from people that are watching. And one that I quite like is, um, if uh, if you all had to employ Gordon now, what would the first thing you'd ask him to do be? <laughs> stand up, stand outside and peel shallots like I did. Okay. <laughs> do what, sorry, Angela? Pick a box of spinach. That's what they make me do on the trial. And then, no, do what's that thing, shallot confit. Every time you went on a trial in any kitchen in those days, you had to make shallot yeah. confit. There's no yeah, shallot right. to make it. Um, I think I'd just ask him to leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> in the restaurant leave us alone <laughs> <laughs> um okay let me see if i can find another one bear with me a second marcus's questions about your daily hair routine obviously god it's a fascination marcus it is it is i think uh, i feel a sponsorship coming on here marcus I you get somewhere uh, <laughs> i think you could be the new timote lady <laughs> You should make sure it has its own Instagram account, Marcus. Marcus. Hello, exactly. <laughs> I'm more of a nosy man myself. <laughs> like that. If you want to look like Marcus Waring, you can use Timo <laughs> Tay. Uh, Jason, what's your worst habit? My worst habit? Hmm. Oh, my worst habit. What's my worst habit? Um, probably... I, uh, what's my worst habit? I can waffle a bit. So I'm, I, 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 rather than rather than just getting direct down to it when I'm when I'm teaching somebody something in the kitchen or something like that, I'll start waffling on a little bit. Um, so probably waffling is probably my worst worst habit. You like a waffle, okay? I like a waffle, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, my next game, my wheel of truth. Oh my goodness. Excited, right? So you all get two spins um, and you can have one pass. So if you don't want to answer the question, you can pass it to somebody else, but you only get one. Okay. Right. right. So Angela, I'll start with you. Yeah. Can we write them down? Yeah. You don't have to write them down. You can just answer them. So you can only hear one song for the rest of your life. What is it? I believe in miracles by the urban circles. Well, that was you were straight there with that. You knew that. Done, I love that song. My best one. Yeah. Well, I've had more wine. I didn't sing it for you, but I'm not going to do that now. But I have been known you, to. You do can that. if you want to. <laughs> no, <it's fine. laughs> you were so straight down line with that one. Um, Marcus, Jason, what about you? Do, do you have one that you would uh, say to them? That mine would be "You'll Never Walk Alone," the, the, the Liverpool national anthem. Yeah. I'm, wow. I'm actually actually. I actually love walking alone, but that's really strange. I love being on. <laughs> Quite normal for you, wearing. We understand that. <laughs> Jason, do you have one? Oasis, Supersonic. Nice. Oh, you always say that I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Well done. Okay, Marcus, you next. When was the last time you told a lie, and what was it? I'm going to pass that to Jason. <laughs> 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 when was the last time I told a lie? 
Remember, this is live and everybody's watching. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I changed. I, ch I, ch I, ch I changed the baby's nappy, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't be bothered. That's a good one. That's a good <laughs> she, one. Like that. She spent four hours with poo in her nappy. Oh, <laughs> That's terrible. Oh dear. Social <laughs> services. I love the social services around the morning. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. All right, Josie, it's yours now. Worst kitchen related injury. What's the worst thing you've ever done in the kitchen? The worst, right. So, so it was two, it was 1998. Stephen Terry had a restaurant, uh, no, 1999. I just got back from Spain. I was doing some interim work for Stephen Terry at a restaurant uh, called Frisch Street Restaurant in Soho. And um, Ben Tish was uh, a young commie chef back then um, working there. And I reduced some, uh, I made the uh, veal stock and then did the second pass of it. So, and then we reduced it down to make the glaze. And it was ticking, low, ticking over nicely on the stove. So I said to Ben, uh, give me a hand picking it up um, and putting it onto the burner. So Ben grabbed one side, I grabbed the other side. Uh, and then we both had our, uh, but Ben lifted it with, a, with an apron and the apron wrapped around his hand. So as we put it onto the stove and we both walked away, it, the, the stock pan came with us and it went all over my foot, all over my feet, reduced veal you. And I spent about two weeks in hospital having skin grafts. So that's the worst thing that's happened to me in, in, a, uh, in a kitchen. Oh. So it's pretty, 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 uh, pretty, pretty grim. So when you took your shoes and stuff off, did it take the, the skin? That's why, that's why I don't wear those stupid Crocs and stuff. <laughs> What are they called? Birkenstocks. I had Birkenstocks at the time and it all melted. Oh, that sounds horrible. Surrendous. <laughs> oh, funny, I'm not laughing. Andy was laughing her head off. It was, it was so bad. Poor old Ben got burnt as well. We were both like, oh. um, we're like, like a month later, we we're both down the local pub because we lived together at the time. We we're both down the local pub. I'm in a wheelchair. He's on crutches, having oh. a pint of beer. And we're like, we're supposed to be professional chefs. Look, it was pathetic. It's like a scene out of Little Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Does that beat you two, or have you got worse injury stories? Oh, not at all. Nothing like that. Worse is a few cuts from me. That's it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, for me, I had a, a very similar one actually. Someone opened a stock pot boiler, a boiler, uh, the tap onto my foot. Same as Jason. Um, I, I ripped my sock off, and the skin came with it. Um, oh. so this was this was chicken stock, so field glass is a lot thicker and burn a lot deeper. But I think I think the, the worst injury for me was I slipped in when I was at the Gavroche. I slipped on the wet floor and I put my hand to stop myself from hitting the floor and to stop uh, to stop myself from hitting the floor. I put my hand onto the top of a solid top and my hand stuck to the top of it. Uh, I'm just listening my hand and my inside my wrist but that was probably the worst injury for me because that, that, that was trying to stop myself from hitting the floor but it happened to be a solid top that I used to stop myself and this is this is the truth right? I work I worked with a chef at my very I worked for a few months at a hotel in, in Skegness uh, called the County Hotel. It was apparently the best hotel in Skirgan <laughs> And there, um, and it was fucking With that shit. Voice over, right? <laughs> and it was fucking shit. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, I, 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 I um, there was a guy who worked there, this little Scottish kid, and he had a glass eye. And I'm like, why am to your eye? And he said, oh, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. And eventually I got it out of him after a couple of weeks. And he he, he was, he was, Apparently he was like turning vegetables and someone said something to him. He turned around and he just stuck, stuck the knife straight in his eye. Oh, <laughs> and then he had a glass eye in his eye. Could you imagine the pain? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean you were turning vegetables? So I was turning vegetables. Someone said something. I turned around and I stuck, and I, and I stuck oh, it in my eye. And I was like, oh. horrendous, horrendous. So <laughs> there it is, kids. Don't turn vegetables. Vegetable. Is that possible? 
What, to turn a vegetable or stuff yourself? No, so we, <laughs> you stuff yourself in the eye. I think it's possible. Ob obviously. Oh, God. <laughs> Ew, right, okay. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, where are we now? Angela, it's you again, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't plan that. This is quite funny. Uh, sing your karaoke song. <laughs> Oh my Come God. on, anyway. I've, seen, I've seen you in Bottom in Dubai. Yeah, we've done. No, the one that I think the best karaoke song is Danny Boy. Oh, Danny Boy. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh. Richard Corrigan went for this. <laughs> <laughs> that would be it. Danny Boy, I think, karaoke song. Okay. Marcus, you're instantly like, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Andrew's about to go off on one there. I thought that's not you a good idea. Gin and tonic, Marcus. No. I, it's a... <laughs> Angela, are you are you at home or are you in High Park there? I'm in the garden. It's such a lovely night. You look like you've been kicked out of the house. Did Neil kick you out? I know. No, Neil's in bed. I'm just in the garden. Oh, lovely. Yeah. He's in bed. No, Neil. Yeah, Neil. Well, he's done the sauce. Oh. He's gone out. <laughs> right. Probably best. Otherwise, he could be walking around behind us. <laughs> I did not expect him to jump in, to be honest. <laughs> right. Oh, we've had that one, we've had that one, we've had that one. Oh, what's your favourite joke? Who's that to? You. Marcus. You. Spam. My favourite joke? Fucking, I don't know. Uh, don't do jokes. Um, of course you don't. Yeah. You're Marcus Greg, Greg Wallace. Wallace. You don't do jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Greg Wallace sells jokes on MasterChef over and over and over and over again. I mean, thousands of jokes. And whenever I want to remember one, I can't remember it. <laughs> oh, he'll be disappointed in you, Marcus. He's unbelievable. He is a joke machine. He, not, he just doesn't stop. But what he doesn't realise is that the jokes that he tells us every season are the same jokes he was telling us last season. <laughs> and I still can't remember them. I don't do jokes. <laughs> Sorry. Anyone else got a joke? I'm no, I've got. I, I don't. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm the same as Mark. I can never remember jokes. No, we'll pass on that one. Come on, next Neil. one. Next one. <laughs> you got out of that one, then, Marcus. No. <laughs> right, Jason. Last one. Oh, what would be the first thing you would do if you woke up and you were the opposite sex? Ooh. What? What was that? What if I woke up you... and I had what? Put <laughs> his fucking underwear on. That's what he'd do. Uh, he'd be putting a G-string on some suspenders and he'd be trying all the kit out. <laughs> if you woke up as the opposite sex, so if you woke up, woke up as a woman, what would be the first thing you would do? <laughs> what would I do? Fuck it out, fuck it out. It's mental. Um, what would I do? Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. You do know. Uh, what would I do? Um, I know what I fucking do with him. <laughs> well, listen, I go and steal all my wife's handbags for sure. <laughs> There's thousands of them there. Jimmy. Um, <laughs> well, I'd, 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 I'd shave this stupid that. tash off and this beard for. Because that won't pass, will it? No, I think that would be quite frightening, actually. <laughs> I've no idea. I've no idea. God knows. I think I'll you do. I think you're being shy. Right. Who are you passing it to if you're passing? I pass it to Marcus. What would I do? Um, I think I'd just go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just hope and pray I'd wake up a man. <laughs> a bit go. harsh. A bit harsh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right okay i won't push it any further um right i've still got time for a few uh more questions and some stories so i mark i need to ask you i don't know if i'm going to pronounce this correctly but um i need to ask you about the nage recipe mm. that, am i saying that correctly sorry with my northern accent sorry, uh, northern. was that the, was that the, the nage recipe that we used to make at the edge uh, it's from Angela, so I believe so. Yeah, I think that case of we used to make this vegetable nage for 
for a dish, which was a, a, a clarified or a clear vegetable stock. And um, Gordon had this incredible recipe, but we had no ingredients in the fridge that actually no correlation between the recipe and what was in the fridge. So <laughs> one day I just went into the fridge and just took any green vegetables some onions and lots of herbs and I just boiled them up, put them in the fridge. And then I didn't make it as often enough as Gordon wanted it to be made. And um, because we put, we also put some lemons in there. I can't remember what the recipe was. And it used to sit in the bottom of the fridge and because the fridge was always open, closed, open, closed, the temperature of the fridge was always going up. And this nage used to go off very quickly. And because I didn't make it as often as Gordon wanted it to be made, um, one day he called out for the nage and it, uh, I had. Um. Oh no, we lost him at the key point. Angela, you might have to finish off the, the finish. Well, I remember a different one because I remember Jason saying, uh, not Jason, Marcus saying to me, make the nage. Exactly what he said, there weren't enough. Food. And he goes, just ram everything into it. I did, made it really badly, got the bollocking of a lifetime. And was waiting for Marcus to say, well, actually, that's I told him to do that, and he never did. So I stitched him, and I said, "Oh, he got it. Marcus's fault." <laughs> <laughs> still got the bollock in, but. <laughs> and you told me to ask Jason about cooking pheasant at the NEC. Yes, Jason, do you remember that? Oh, I do. Oh <laughs> my god. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> so we gone. So this whole thing of Birmingham got a little bit out of control. So basically it was like, we used to go to Birmingham and we, um, you know, Gordon like the rest of us liked, to, liked a bit of a bit of a night out. And we was judging Gordon's, Gordon Ramsay scholarship. Um, and then Gordon thought it'd be a good idea that we all went out the night before. Um, and we, I got a little bit carried away. Um, at the most horrendous hangover. Um, got to the judging, uh, threw up in the back, which is also <laughs> the palette, um, and then uh, carried on judging these young chefs who the whole life's ahead of them. Um, uh, but anyway, I did a very professional job. Uh, I held together. I then went back to my hotel room, threw up some more, had a shower, and went back out. And um, it was my turn to do a demonstration on the main stage. And back then, I wasn't quite so confident on uh, doing this type of stuff. And so I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm shaking a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not feeling the best. And uh, I was last on. So I was last on the stage. And um, so I'm doing this pheasant dish. And it's all sponsored by Rationale and all that type of stuff. And so I, I did this dish, put the uh, seal it off in the pan, put it in the oven. And then uh, the whole... You know, everyone around me is like in stitches. All of the, all of the people watching, Ange, Gordon, everybody. And I'm thinking, what's everyone laughing at? I've only put the pheasant in the in the oven during. And then, anyway, carried on, carried on cooking. Uh, and then I turn my back, see what everyone's laughing at, and I've got a pheasant uh, in the oven on wash. So, <laughs> so, so the rationale is washing my pheasant. As, as everybody's watching me do a demo, the, the, the pheasants roar. Jerry Gordon's literally on the floor laughing. Andrew's laughing. Mark, everyone's laughing. And so I was like, well... Oh, my God, I'm that was the funniest thing. I'm that was so I tried to make watercress soup with really hard potatoes. And you just... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, help oh, me, help oh, me. Oh, this fucking, <laughs> fucking thing was a disaster. I bet all the young kids would go... And how's he a mission star chef? What the fuck's going on up there? <laughs> in tears. I love that you put a pheasant on to wash. <laughs> Unbelievable. But listen, I've got I've, I've got one for Ange, right? Oh, so when, when we when we lived in Dubai. Oh, I know me, this. Me and Ange got quite close. And uh, you know, she was uh, you know, she was like a sister to me. She looked after me really well and stuff. And you know, and uh, you know, and, and bearing in mind, I'd, I'd only worked for Gordon to that point for about eight nine months a year, maybe uh, a little bit at Royal Hospital Road. Uh, I'd done a little bit of helping with a bit of his filming and stuff. And uh, um, and so it was all quite new to me still. So I got out there, and um, you know, uh, Angie had a hire car. I had a hire car. 
Uh, we both lived at Golden Sands number five. And, uh, it's, you know, bearing in mind, I'm just going to paint the picture for you. You know, in Dubai or in, in the Middle East in general, petrol and diesel is like 5p a litre. Every, every, every 60 yards, there's a petrol station plug in you don't even have to get out of your car there's some dude there who gets out fills it up cleans your windows you know gets you a can of coke whatever you want and it, this is like two o'clock in the fucking morning i got a phone call uh where are you uh i'm in bed Angel. what's up and she's like you're not out I said no no i'm in bed i just told you i'm in bed what's up? she was i've run out of petrol i said how the fuck have you run out of petrol <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter how i've run out of petrol i'm on the shades eye road get in your car and come and fucking get me so i'm like all right i'm on the way off i go I pick her up, sort it out, get the car, for, we, we get the car sorted out, get her back. Fucking three weeks later, it happens again. <laughs> and can you just not fill your fucking car up with petrol? <laughs> like, it's cheap. There's like more petrol stations than, than camels, Jane. Just fill your car up with petrol, sweetheart. It's all good. <laughs> it's but, but she doesn't need to if you're going to come and rescue her every oh, time. At two o'clock <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marks, have you got any stories about Angela or Jason? It's really, I, 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 it's really funny. I, I wish I miss uh, the opportunity of, of spending time like that as chefs. When I worked with Angela, I was always, I was always her sous chef or Sean Ramsey's partner, and I don't think I ever, I, I never really ever worked with Jason. Um, you know, Jason, you know, Angela was always there and about with us as part of the team. And we never really ever socialised much because it was always like I was the head chef and Angela was the sous chef. And it was really funny. But I always, I think where Jason, we never really worked together. And Jason was an up-and-coming chef in sort of a different camp. And I remember when Jason used to always, wherever, whether it was Lauren Cher, Aubergine, Royal Hospital Road, was always the chef that came in at quarter to 11 at night after he a shift in the kitchen. And, uh, and I always remember in the Aubergine, you know, we knew chefs, but we didn't really know them very well. There was no social media, there was no iPhone, so we just knew chefs in different kitchens. And we knew that Jason was a chef of the other camp, you know, sort of uh, Marco, uh, uh, Marco and Pierre Kaufman and all the chefs that Jason had worked for. And then when Jason used to turn up at the, end of the service and we had just done, we were doing six day weeks of the aubergine and Jason would turn up at quarter to 11 at night with a friend or a girlfriend or another chef and a tasting menu and Gordon used to hit the fucking roof. It's like, oh my God, what the fuck is this fucking guy coming in here, fucking eating this and blah, blah, blah. And then come, he would, he would swear, slap Jason off to heaven. And then go upstairs and be nice as fucking ninepence to him. Uh, <laughs> take his hand. You know, like, how you doing, Jason? Blah, blah, blah. Come downstairs. And then like, fuck her from fucking Skegness. Let's get him fed and let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and then and, and all, stealing all my recipes. <laughs> yeah. And, and Angela knows when someone came in late at the aubergine, it was the worst thing ever. All we wanted to do was get home. We had four hours sleep. And old this geezer from Skegness would walk in for his fucking dinner. I used to do it on purpose. I know. I know. I go home, have a cup of tea, watch the TV. I thought, like, those fuckers will be cleaning down now. <laughs> like, taxi. <laughs> <laughs> right, last question. Um, I said when we first came on this uh, on this call, Jason, I said uh, that you were um, challenging J um, James Martin in your in your where you were because you said you had a bar and then what else? What else did you show us? Are you going to show us what else you've got that's better than James Martin? What's better than James Martin? Yeah, no, I said I said I, you said my house will give us a chance. I said I bet he hasn't got. I showed you the massage room. Let's have a look. Don't show you. Yeah, I don't know. How do I turn? How do I turn my thing around? I'll turn it around. You didn't know. Typical dad oh, there selfie go. there. Okay. <laughs> That's the bar. That's look. the bar. See That's look. my bar to shame. There you go, look. Bit, nice. bit, of, bit of bully. <laughs> <laughs> there we take. go. That's the Pac-Man machine. I'm really good at Pac-Man. <laughs> and then that higher... Uh, well, it's actually the missus, actually, but they're, they, that's our little... Uh, so fancy. That's anyway, the anyway, point was... It's up for sale, so if anybody wants to buy it... 
I can show you if you're interested. Rooms. <laughs> So the question was, um, you've all been on um, Saturday Kitchen, right? What is your best uh, James Martin story? Do you all have a James Martin story? Uh, do I have a James Martin story? Go on, go on, Angela. Go on. Angela, you go first. Marcus, well, actually, as you would know as well, Carl, having met Neil, um, he's Scottish for a start and doesn't hold back when he wants to say something. And he and bought Neil James is your Martin's. husband for people that, are, people that are listening. So he bought James Martin's spice grinder and we were, and it basically broke within a day or so. And we were all at the <laughs> Fort Mamesa food wars and James Martin's talking, yeah, coffee. And Neil has, doesn't bat an eyelid, he goes up and literally says, like, Oi, your spice grinder doesn't work. I want another one. I want another one <laughs> and I was just standing there, oh my God. And then the best thing about Neil is he speaks French. He's, he's worked in France for five years. So he turns to Pierre, starts talking to him fluent French, chat, chat, chat. And he goes, I haven't forgotten about that spice grinder, mind you. I want a new one in the post. It broke. <laughs> so that's James. We're still waiting for James. We are still waiting for that spice grinder. Thank you very much. That's, that's <laughs> class. class. I love it. Anyone else? Uh, James Martin. Yeah, Marcus. Don't really have one, but I, 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 I remember <clears throat> when James went on to Saturday Kitchen, uh, and we're all like, <sighs> Saturday Kitchen live television. Really, you know, should should we be really cooking with James Martin? He's not really up there with you know with the Michelin star chefs and all the banter in you know the Gordon kitchens. And it was like, like you know, really with this big this big guy from Yorkshire. You know, it it, it spent most his life on ready steady kitchen ready steady yeah ready steady, ready steady cook uh wearing a bandana uh and did a few hotel de bands and he, he was he was not the sort of chef that you sort of think well should should, should should i go and do this show and anyway you think okay well i'll go and do this television show and with this i'm going to cook with james martin and you think well he, you know i'm bigger than him and he's not won this and he's not done that and, and when you were really young and the show came off on you never really knew whether it was good for your career or not. <clears throat> when you go on to it and you see him, he's got an earpiece, he's doing a piece to camera, he's doing the auto cue, he's cooking, he's hosting, and he's bringing all these Michelin star chefs into the studio. And I think every time I went on the show, I have to say, I used to walk away in admiration that how open he was to us, allowing us to come on the show what we want could do and promote what we were promoting at that time on his TV show. And I think James Martin uh, went up in everyone's <clears throat> estimation as the years went by, uh, just how good and what a natural chef he is in the world of television, but what a fabulous chef and a fabulous cook and a great host on television. And I think I don't have a bad story about him, but uh, I remember what I used to think about him until I went onto the show and watched him in his own setting and it's quite impressive. No, he's brilliant at it. I mean, well, I mean, he drank we, a bottle of gin when he came and did this with me. So, I know, we I, all, in forty minutes. So. Have, you, have you have you have you hosted that one, Marcus? Did you do any of the hosting when it was? No. Um, I, I was I I, I couldn't and, do it. I never. Uh, it is. I mean, it's brilliant, and you've got to put your take your hat off to James. He did it for ten years, and. The, one of the reasons Amanda always says, will you come and do it again, you know, to give Matt a break and all the rest of it. But it's exhausting. I know it sounds ridiculous. That one day just knocks you for like two, three days because you're up at like five in the morning, you're rehearsing, doing a double rehearsing, you're going on the Friday. You know, so a fair play to him to suddenly go after 10 years ago, I want my weekends oh, back. That's amazing. You know, and, you've got, and you've got to do research and stuff. I only presented yeah. it once, and I think it it comes down as the the worst Saturday Kitchen in history of the TV <laughs> program. <laughs> even the day, even the Daily Mail was saying that saying Jason Hamilton bombed on Saturday Kitchen. It was so <laughs> I, left, I left more gaps than a, I left more gaps than 1960s Tube Station. It was horrendous. <laughs> that was the actual headline. Yeah. So someone someone tuned in and said, "Is that Captain? Is that is that is that General Zod from Superman presenting Saturday Kitchen?" <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna cook he's gonna start cook, cook, cutting cucumbers with his with his laser eyes. 
<laughs> oh my gosh! Stop! Stop! Uh, <laughs> it's so funny. Right. That's it. Last orders at the bar. Um, I wish I could carry on talking to you all, but I do have to bring this to a close, unfortunately. Thank you so much for being brilliant guests. I've enjoyed it so much. I really hope that everybody else has enjoyed it as okay. much as we have. Um, before I go, I'm going to say who we've got next week. We have got the lads at the bar this next week. I'm probably going to very much regret this. So I've got Claude Brosey, Sat Baines. Oh, gosh. And Daniel Clifford. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, I'm um, no filter. I'm warning everybody now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, Make yeah. sure all your kids are in bed. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's going to be a good one. But, yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much, and good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Oh, Thank it's been brilliant. Much, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.